Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to the Emanuel Lutheran Church member of the Evangelical Lutheran Synod on this <coughs> presentation of our Lord's Sunday. And the theme for today is the glory of the Lord is revealed. And our theme for today then is uh, as we look at our first To them that believe on his name, 
He giveth the power to become the sons of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. We join in the psalm of the day which is printed in your book, in Psalm 84, and we read that response. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even thanks to the words of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out to God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself. Where she may have her young, a place near your altar. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength, till each appears before God. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield. O oh God, look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. But I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord is the sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk his ways. O Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you.
Lord God, Heavenly Father, who has given thy Son to be our Savior, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. We beseech thee, enlighten our hearts, that we may know thy grace and fatherly will in him towards us, and obtain everlasting life through the same. Thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. salvation 
but they also knew God's promise to send a Savior. In Jesus, they had everything they wanted and needed. They truly had a reason to celebrate. The Holy Gospel is written in the second chapter of St. Luke, reading verses 22 through 40. Please rise for the reading. <laughs>
Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep us in faith like that of Simeon and Anna, so that they may see, that we may see the Lord's salvation and give thanks to him face to face in eternity. Amen. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our text is written in the second chapter of Luke, again reading verses 22 through 26. We read as follows in Jesus' name. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male will be called holy to the Lord. And they came to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, waiting for the comfort of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. O Lord, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is true. Amen. <clears throat> when upon God's command, Moses erected the tabernacle in the wilderness, a cloud covered the tent of meetings, and the glory of the Lord filled that place. So Moses could not enter, because the Lord was in the tent of meetings. When King Solomon had built and dedicated that first temple in Jerusalem, a cloud filled the temple so that the priests could not enter the Holy of Holies because the Lord filled his house. God's glory. God himself was present in both the tabernacle and the first temple, and he revealed his glorious presence as an outward sign of brilliant and beautiful cloud. Now Solomon's temple was destroyed because of the consequences of Israel's idolatry. And yet, remembering the covenant that he had made with his people, the Lord promised that a second temple was to be built and added that the splendor of this house would be greater than the one before. When his when this temple was completed, there is nothing that tells us that said the Lord came down and filled it. So why then did the Lord promise that it would be greater? Because the Messiah was to come, to preach, and to accomplish the work for which he was sent. As Malachi declared clearly, Behold, I sent my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Through this advent, the Messiah, the glory of that second temple became much greater because in his visible body he came to the temple. And the glory of the Lord was revealed. Now this took place for the first time when Mary, with her little son, the firstborn of God, presented herself before the Lord to offer the required sacrifices ordained by God. And aged Simeon openly declared that her child was to be the Messiah. Today we look at our theme, The Glory of the Lord is Revealed, and we concentrate on these two stories, the story of Christ's presentation in the temple, and the story of Simeon. <coughs> Dear fellow redeemed, this first story takes place in verses 22 through 24 of our text, and here the evangelist refers to the two laws of the Old Testament. The first regarding the purification of women, is recorded in Leviticus 12. If a woman bore a male child, she was to be considered unclean for 40 days, and if a female child, for 80 days. 
Then she was to bring to the priest at the door of the tent of meetings a lamb one year old for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or turtle dove for a sin offering. And if she could not afford the lamb, she was to bring a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons, one for the burnt offering and the other for the sin offering. These the priests offered before the Lord and made atonement for her. Now this law not only served to safeguard a woman's health, but was chiefly a reminder of original sin, the inherited, which is inherited by all children through birth. The male child received circumcision on the eighth day as a sign or seal of his righteousness, which by faith, whereby his transgressions were forgiven, his sins were covered, and where he received into God's covenant of grace. Nevertheless, the mother and child were considered unclean for a time longer, just as it is for each of us, as evil lusts remain in our flesh, and it must be opposed by constant repentance and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The burnt and sin offerings for purification then indicate that we too must cling to Christ, in true faith. He is our Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But how does this concern Christ and his mother? The law said, if a woman conceives, that is, in the usual manner, they are sinful and unclean in God's eyes. But our Lord was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Mary conceived and gave birth without sin. The Holy Spirit eliminated sin's poison from every drop out of which the holy temple of Christ's body was born. Therefore, he was not subject to original sin and was conceived and born holy, and yet Christ subjected himself to this law. And as Christ received circumcision and holy baptism, not for his own sake, but for ours. So he also submitted to this law for our salvation. He was circumcised and baptized that in him we are redeemed and we receive God's covenant of grace by holy baptism. He subjected himself to this law of purification, not because of any cleanness was found in him, but he was presenting himself before his heavenly Father as the Lamb of God, to whom the sins of the world were laid, and in this way made purification for all of our sins, offering himself on the cross as the Lamb of God for the sins of the entire world. Now the other law which Christ submitted to in this story applies to firstborn males. When the Lord slew the firstborn in all of Egypt, but spared the firstborn among the Israelites, he ordained as a memorial that the firstborn man and beast were to be given to the Lord. Animals were to be offered in sacrifice or could be redeemed for a sum of money. Firstborn sons were either to be left in the house of God or redeemed for five shekels of silver. And we have a perfectly perfect example of that in Hannah, who took her young son Samuel to the temple to live and work in the house of the Lord. Therefore, Christ, now as our true high priest of the New Testament, presented himself for us to his heavenly Father, all the firstborn among Israelite in Egypt would have been destroyed by that angel if the blood of that sacrifice passed over lamb had not been applied to the door. Of course, there we have the picture of Christ sacrificing his blood on the cross to cover our sins. And later, all firstborn would have to be consecrated 
and given to the Lord. All this points to Christ, who is the true firstborn, the true high priest of the New Testament, for whose sake we are saved from the fear of hell. This firstborn presented himself to the Lord in our stead and remained in the Lord's service to give his life as a ransom for many. He is our eternal king and high priest. And yet such honor and glory he does not keep for himself alone, but makes us partakers of it, of his honor and goods. He has made us his church, priests of the holy God and Father, if you will. He makes us God's children according to his human nature, and all things are put into his hands. So what are we to do? We should live as God's obedient children. We should reign over our flesh and blood. We should abstain from sin and evil lusts that war against us and our soul. And pray that the Holy Spirit, we would surrender fully to His service. That He would let our offerings be pleasing to God and make us partakers of this rich inheritance of heaven. Now, the second part of our Holy Gospel tells us about the story of Simeon. Luke tells us that when the parents brought their son Jesus to the temple to do for him according to the custom of the law, the pious Simeon came also. Now, Simeon is described in the text as a righteous and devout man. And it is said of him that he looked for the consolation of Israel, that is, the coming of the promised Messiah. We are told also that it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. <coughs> Inspired by the Holy Spirit, he came to the temple, obeying the Lord's command. But all of this would have not been pleasing to God if it had not flowed from his genuine faith in Christ. For such faith is not a work of human power. It is not a decision that we make, but it is a gift of the Holy Spirit who was upon him, kindling this faith in him, keeping alive this hope, and adoring him with special prophetic gifts. Would that God make us Simeon, that we too might attain such a perfect power as we enter into eternal life and see God and Christ face to face. Now we read that Simeon took the child in his arms and blessed God. And inspired by the Holy Spirit, he said, Lord, you now dismiss your servant in peace according to your word, because my eyes have seen your salvation. Just as Jacob in the Old Testament had done when he finally saw his son Joseph again, he exclaimed, Now let me die, since I have seen your face. So pious Simeon declares, I can now die in peace, for he is in, he is the world's Savior, he is the light of the Gentiles, the glory of Israel, born for the sake of men, for the salvation is from the Jews. In him only and alone are they are to seek all their honor and glory before God. May that be for us also, that we receive this blessed preparation for our death. So what made Simeon so ready for his death? First, the heart must be filled up with God through prayer and devotion. As Simeon said, Lord, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace. The blessed art of dying can be learned from God alone. As David says in the psalm, it must be acquired by prayer. Particularly, when death begins to knock at our door, we must withdraw from our heart, from all created and temporal things, and turn to God in prayer. 
Paul put it this way in 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Do not grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Of course, we will sorrow for in death over our loved ones. But we have the truth of the resurrection which gives us peace. As David testified in the psalm, my soul thirsts for thee like a parched lamb. You see, death is God's messenger. That should come clear at a funeral service. That it is one of God's messengers to us. Because he extorts us then to cling to God. To commit our soul into his hands to keep and preserve. Second, death must not be regarded as a long way off. But we must expect and provide for it daily. Death slinks after us every hour and every moment. Yes, we carry it with us. Therefore, we should always be ready. No harm is ever done by expecting death daily. And yet we are spared for a time. But there is great harm. When death is disregarded for a single day, and we are suddenly overtaken by it. Third, the right preparation for death includes that we wait patiently until God himself summons us. We are placed in a line of battle here on earth by God, the heavenly commander, and we dare not forget but must wait until he calls us. He has given us life, and into his hands we are to trust. If he wills us to have it, we are by no means then to shorten it. Fourth, we are always to engage in God's service. By sin against our conscience, we often render service to the devil. Therefore, we are to be on our guard against such sins and serve God in holiness and righteousness. The man who serves God will be able to rule over death. As it says in Revelations 4.13, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord henceforth. And if we are to die in the Lord, we must also live in the Lord. That is, serve Him in devotion. Fifth, we are to keep quiet and call hearts. How many of you fear death? The outward appearance of death. It is not to be frightened, it is not to frighten us, for it is only going home of the faith who will never see death. In this life, we are captive of the law of sin, but by death we are released from that prison. And this word released here is used when talking about the freeing of slaves, our return to our fatherland or homes, to indicate that even though in this life we are strangers and aliens, through death we come to the heavenly home, a freeing from slavery and from the hard service and duties that we often perform. But through death we come to life. Again, do not grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Finally, it is used of the release of war. In this life we are obligated to fight continually. But through death we are translated are trans from the church militant to the church victorious, to the assembly of the elect, with golden crowns on our heads as a sign of victory. Yes, the art of blissful dying, not to grieve, belongs especially to all who have true faith. Those who lay hold on Christ, the Prince of Life and Conqueror of Death, for my eyes have seen thy salvation, Simeon said. We do not see Christ with our physical eyes as Simeon and Anna saw him, but we do see him with the eyes of faith of our hearts. With 
without this inner spiritual seeing. The outward physical seeing would have been of little value. The man who sees Christ in this way dies happy, for Christ is the author of life. His word is the word of life. And whoever holds fast to this word passes from death to life. So in the midst of death, the child of God finds that true life, yes, true life and salvation. Amen. Please rise for the rest of you. <laughs> and now may the peace of God which passes all our understanding keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, bless the gifts here given, that they may help dispense the saving grace of your gospel into the world. Bless each giver, that with true love and unselfish hearts, we may always be ready and willing to put our earthly treasures to heavenly use, to the glory of your name. Almighty and everlasting God, who are worthy to be held in reverence by all the children of men, we give thee most humble and hearty thanks for the innumerable blessings, both temporal and spiritual, which without any merit or worthiness on our part thou hast bestowed upon us. We praise thee especially that thou hast preserved unto us in thy purity thy saving word and the sacred ordinances of thy house. And we beseech thee, O Lord, to preserve and extend thy kingdom of grace and to grant unto the holy church throughout the world purity of doctrine and faithful pastors, who shall preach thy word with power and help all who hear rightly to understand and truly believe it. Send forth labors into the harvest, open the door of faith unto all the heathen and unto the people of Israel. In mercy remember the enemies of thy church and grant unto them repentance unto life. Be thou the protector and defender of thy people in all time of tribulation and danger, and may we in communion with thy church and in brotherly unity with all our fellow Christians fight the good fight of faith, and in the end receive the salvation of our souls. Bestow thy grace upon all the nations of the earth, especially do we entrust thee to bless our land and all its inhabitants, and all who are in authority. Cause thy glory to dwell among us, and let mercy and truth, righteousness and peace everywhere prevail. 
To this end, we commend to thy care all our schools, and pray thee to make them nurseries of useful knowledge and Christian virtue, that they may bring forth the wholesome fruits of life. Graciously defend us from all calamities by fire and water, from war and pestilence, from scarcity and famine. Protect and prosper everyone in his appropriate calling, and cause all useful arts to flourish among us. Be thou the God and Father of the widow and the fatherless children, the helper of the sick and the needy, and the comforter of the forsaken and distressed. Except we beseech thee our bodies and souls, our hearts and minds, our talents and powers, together with the offerings we bring before thee, which is our reasonable service. And as we are strangers and pilgrims on earth, help us by true faith and a godly life to prepare for the world to come. Doing the work thou hast given us to do while this day, before night comes when no man can work. And when our last hour shall come, support us by thy power. Receive us into thy everlasting kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God. This we pray in the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for our next
give you his peace. Tuesday sewing group, Wednesday confirmation, and Thursday confirmation. 
And then if anyone would like to come to Saturday, uh, Calvary's Ladies' Aid is at 9.30. You're welcome to come to that too. Next Sunday, then, we have a regular worship uh, with communion, should have said, uh, coffee and fellowship, and a council meeting. Are there any other announcements that you need? If not, may the grace of God go with you. Well,